Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar um, which is as you can see on the screen about charity tax concessions and endorsement. My name is Matt Crichton and I'm from the ACNC's guidance and education team and joining me to present today's webinar is a colleague from the ATO who as the title on the screen says is the not-for-profit technical in from the not-for-profit technical advice area Mel Knight. Hello Mel. Oh, hi Matt, how are you? Very good, and you? I'm good, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to have you on to talk about this important topic and we've got a lot of people joining us today as usual for the Tax Concessions webinar. Just before we do get into the um, content proper, just a few little admin things to, to let you know about. Um, you can ask questions as we go through the broadcast using the navigation panel um, in the GoToWebinar, the GoToWebinar's navigation panel. We have a couple of colleagues, Chris and Bree, awaiting your questions as we go. So if something pops in, up in your head and you want to ask about it at the time, feel free to send us a question and we'll do our best to get back to you. If there are really lots of questions that come through and we might take a little while to get back to you, but nonetheless, we will endeavour to get back to everyone. Um, if you do, if you'd rather watch the presentation first and ask questions later, we will allow ten or fifteen minutes or so at the end to have just a question and answer session. And in that bit, we will um, take some of the, the questions that we feel are probably have a, have a broader um, relevance to other people and, and ask them uh, answer them live. If you um, if the question is a little bit too specific for your organisation, um, it's, it's probably best to give us or the ATO a call or, or a separate email even if you want some more specific advice. Um, we may be able to help you with some general stuff during the webinar, but yeah, for some the really specific stuff, it's probably best to, to get in touch with us separately. And if you're having um, trouble listening to the audio as we go through, there is an option to um, dial into the webinar and uh, listen on via a phone. Um, when you signed up, you would have received a confirmation email which has some of the details of that. But you call up a number and you can effectively use your phone to listen into the audio if you're having trouble over Wi-Fi or your internet connection. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be published on our website and on our YouTube page, as all of them are. So. If you miss something uh, or if there's a slide with some information you didn't get a chance to jot down or something like that, never fear, you'll be able to look at it later. Um, we publish all our webinars um, on our website and we will send you a follow-up email to let you know when that has been published and that will include many of the links that we uh, present in the webinar today. So no need to um, jot down everything you see frantically, you will be able to um, do that later and get an email with all the links in there later as well. Okay, that out the way, let's uh, move on to today's presentation and we'll just go over what we'll cover today. First, we'll have a look at just general char charity tax concessions, what they include. We'll just let you know a little bit about how the ACNC and the ATO work together. There's a, a fair bit of collaboration and crossover with some of this and um, come across some misconceptions about which resp uh, which responsibilities lie where and, and it would be worth clarifying that for you, I think. The third dot point there is deductible gift recipients and that's a big one. A lot of people want to know about um, this particular tax concession and we will go over that in some detail. And finally, we'll touch on a couple of specific uh, charity categories that, that come with certain tax concessions um, of their own called health promotion charities and public benevolent institutions. And we'll just, we'll just take you through some of the, the details of those two categories. Okay, so the first one, ACNC and charity tax concessions. First, it's worth pointing out that the ACNC is the national charity regulator and the ACNC's job is to register organisations as charities. That, that has a um, a knock-on effect to eligibility for tax concessions, but the ACNC's role isn't to endorse tax concessions. Where the connection is, is as the second dot point here shows, that charities must be registered with the ACNC to access Commonwealth charity tax concessions from the ATO. So while the ACNC will decide on an organisation's eligibility to be registered as a charity, it is still the um, the realm of the ATO to then uh, endorse 
whatever tax concessions it may be eligible for. And of course, some tax concessions are only available for particular types of charities. We will get onto this in a little bit more detail later, but it is important to bear in mind that just because your organisation is registered as a charity doesn't mean it automatically comes with every tax concession you've ever heard of. There, there are certain categories and certain types of tax concessions that are only allowed for certain types of charities. But as I said, we'll get into a bit of this um, in a little bit. So now I will pass over, I'll stop talking, I've been talking a lot and you're probably sick of my voice. I'll pass over to Mel to take us over some of the role of the Australian Tax Office in, um, in this whole collaboration with the, AT, with the ACNC and, and charity registration. Over to you, Mel. What does the ATO do in this partnership? So our role, as, as it's stated there, is to administer um, the tax systems in Australia and also to administer the tax concessions that are available to um, all not-for-profits um, and in particular charities that we're talking about today. Um, so after the ACNC has decided on charity status, then um, your application usually comes over to the ATO and we will then make a decision about whether or not an organisation is eligible for tax concessions. And with some of those tax concessions as well, there are some special conditions that need to be met um, before we can actually endorse you. And we'll talk about them, I think, in a little bit more detail when we get to the tax concessions. I just want to make a point too, like while we're at this stage, that um, if you are a charity or your organisation has a charitable purpose, um, you're not able to self-assess your income tax exemption or any of the other concessions. So there is a, a requirement under the law that you are registered with the ACNC and then endorsed by the ATO for the tax concessions. And that's relevant because previously it, it was a little bit different, right? Yeah, and, and I think there is some confusion as well because in the tax law, there are certain types of not-for-profit organisations that can self-assess their income tax exemption. So if they've got, um, you know, other purposes, maybe sporting clubs or um, community service type organisations, and there's no requirement for them to actually go through this registration process obviously with the ACNC because they're not charitable um, but the, you know no need to be endorsed by the ACNC so I think the point here is that if, if your organisation has a charitable purpose you have to be registered with the ACNC and endorsed by the ATO otherwise we consider you to be taxable. Right <coughs> excuse me um, and just here on the bottom of this slide, we have um, a link to the ABN lookup, which is abr.business.gov.au. The relevance of that is that um, entities uh, listed on here, according to their um, Australian business number, w w it'll show what um, or whether it's endorsed for certain tax concessions. While the ACNC charity register will show that an organisation's registered as a charity, it doesn't go into the details of um, the certain tax concessions that it has. So the business register uh, website uh, has some more of those details. Yep, that's right. Now we'll just have a look at how the ACNC and the ATO work together. So as Mel said, organisations can apply for uh, tax concessions um, when applying to register with the ACNC. The, the significance of this means that you don't need to do two separate applications to do separate government departments. You apply for charity registration with the ACNC and within that form, there's a bit a section there that asks you whether you want some tax concessions for your organisation, if it is registered and eligible. And then um, once the ACNC has said yes to the charity part of it, it's, it passes on the application to the ATO to assess the tax concessions. And then if if the organisation is eligible to endorse it. But also, and I'll pass um, this over to you, Mel, to explain a little bit, but the third dot point, as you can see here, says that charities can also apply for tax concessions at any time directly from the ATO. This is, I suppose, a little bit of a different stream, and, and this is where an organisation may already be registered with the ACNC, right? 
Yeah, that's right. So um, the tax concessions that we're talking about today, there is a prerequisite that um, organisations are registered charities. So if you have already gone through that process with the ACNC and you need to either change or apply for new endorsements, you can do that directly with the ATO. And that would be um, a form from the ATO to the ATO and just the ATO to assess that there's, there's generally um, not a requirement to come back through the ACNC for this, right? No, that's right. So we have some um, endorsement forms available on our website um, for tax concessions and or deductible gift recipient status so they can be filled out and sent directly to the ATO. But obviously, if you haven't been through your uh, registration process with the ACNC, um, we would need to send you back through that channel. And just getting on to the charity tax concessions, just the general ones now, let's, let's have a look at what they actually are and, and what they entail. So the first one here, um, Mel, it mentions that tax concessions are available to registered charities. And this, I suppose, is what we would refer to as maybe the standard suite of tax, tax concessions. The, um, I'll let you talk about each one as they come up. We've got income tax exemption here. Yes, so um, this is the one that generally applies to everyone. Um, so it means income tax exemption when you're um, endorsed by us, it means that all of your income, um, both ordinary income and any kind of statutory income is exempt from income tax and you will not need to lodge a tax return with us on an annual basis. So what we do when we process that role is, um, you know, give you income tax exemption and essentially switch off um, any requirement to lodge an income tax return. Now that doesn't mean the commissioner might, you know, come to you at a later date and actually ask you to lodge a return. Um, but it, it I, I, generally speaking, it means, you know, there's no obligation for you to lodge or pay income tax. And the second one here, goods and services tax concession. Um, probably the most misunderstood concession. Um, so, this um, goods and services tax concession is like a suite of concessions. Um, a lot of people misunderstand it and think it means that they're actually exempt or their organisation is exempt from paying GST um, on things that they buy. So um, it doesn't mean that. What, what the concessions involves, so first of all, it's a higher GST registration threshold. So not-for-profits um, are not required to register for GST until they their turnover is 150,000. Um, so that's not different to normal business entities. Um, and then the, the other concessions really depend on what your organisation does. So it allows you to calculate the GST payable on supplies that you make in a different way. So for charities, some of the examples are that, um, you know, if you have non-commercial activities, so you might be providing things that, um, you know, 75% um, of their actual market value, you can actually treat that sale as GST free, which means that you won't need to collect or pay GST. Um, there are some um, GST concessions for um, things like when you're selling donated secondhand goods. So there's a whole list of different concessions that are available and it really depends on kind of what you do uh, as to whether or not they're going to be applicable to you. Um, but it definitely does not exempt you from paying GST. Right, okay, so it sounds like there's a few things that um, may apply or may not apply to certain organisations, but yeah. the point of it not being an exemption is really important. Yeah, and, and I guess like with this one, our website has a lot of information about GST concessions just in a very simple kind of table. So if you're unsure about it, I think first visit there and then later on we'll give you our phone number. You can give us a ring if you've still got questions. And the last one here, we've got um, fringe benefits tax, and it has two options, a rebate and an exemption. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, fringe benefits tax concessions, and this we, we will go into detail a little bit later when we talk about those particular charity types. Um, but these two, so a rebate, if you provide um, 
um, things other than salary and wages to your employees. So you'd be providing kind of non-cash benefits um, in place of salary and wages. Um, you may be entitled to a rebate um, of the, the FBT payable on those non-cash benefits. Um, and the exemption just allows you to provide um, exempt benefits to an employee up to a capped amount. So I kind of think if the rebate is like a discount on the tax that your organisation would have to pay um, and the exemption um, allows you to just provide exempt benefits and you won't pay any FBT as long as you stay under the capped amount for each employee. Right. And I did say that there was the last one, but there's actually a fourth. <laughs> and this one says refund of yeah. credits. <clears throat> Yep, so refund of franking credits, um, they're available. It's quite a topical thing at the moment, I think, just coming out of the election. Um, but this concession allows charities that receive um, franking credits to claim a refund of those franking credits from the, from the ATO. Um, obviously, it's only applicable like if you receive those credits, but there are a number of eligibility criteria to claiming them as well. And we will get into some of the um, eligibility criteria a little bit later on. Not not all charities are eligible for all things. It does depend on the type of charity that you are. Um, the big one, deductible gift recipients. This is the one that a lot of um, people in organisation or charities want to know about. So we'll go through this in a little bit of detail. Um, charities endorsed as a deductible gift recipient can receive tax deductible donations. So this is, um, oh, actually, Mel, I'll let you explain what that means. Yeah, so what it means is that um, you can receive um, gifts from donors that will be tax deductible to the donor. So it's quite a, a sought after endorsement from the ATO. Um, it makes your um, fundraising, I think, a little bit bit easier if, if you know you're eligible to be endorsed. Um, and so that second point there is just the, the donation is tax deductible. So donors um, can deduct an amount from their income tax when they lodge their tax returns. Um, so there are, and a lot of people are surprised by this, there are about 50 different categories of DGR. Um, and each each one of them has their own very specific um, set of, of requirements. Um, Matt, do you want me to give a couple of examples, do you think? Or? Yeah, sure. I think um, it's, it's worth pointing them out and a couple of examples will help, I think, because there is that misconception yeah. that once an organisation is registered as a charity, it's therefore automatically eligible for these tax deductible donations and people think that they can then offer um, that that tax deduction on donations as soon as they're registered as a charity. But but it's definitely not the case, is it? Yeah, and it, it is a common misconception. Um, so there are some very definite kind of charitable subtypes with the ACNC. And, you know, we are going to talk about the PBIs and HPCs um, later on, but they are a definite kind of category that you can be registered with the ACNC with that, that will then enable you to be endorsed as a DGR under those categories. And then we have um, categories like school building funds, public libraries, public museums. Um, another um, large category that, that we look after are animal welfare charities. And I think they're worth talking about because you can be registered with the ACNC under a charitable subtype, um, you know, that indicates that you're looking after animals and caring for them. Um, but it might not necessarily mean that you're eligible for DGR endorsement. So our eligibility requirements for that category um, depend on you meeting some specific activity tests um, that, that, you know, you need to be looking after animals that are lost or mistreated without owners. So it's kind of like a direct activity test that we, we lay over the DGR endorsement. So they're just a few of the categories. Um, all of the categories are listed on our website and, and some of them are really specific, like war memorial repair funds, um, but then some of the categories are more general.
And just this third dot point here, well, actually, it's worth mentioning the second one we had there, that only 38% of registered charities are endorsers DGRs, which may be a surprising stat for a lot of people because, as we mentioned, that misconception that all registered charities um, are allowed to offer tax-deductible donations, and it's it's not the case, and, and actually a minority uh, are eligible to do that. The third dot point here about DGR endorsement is decided by the ATO. Just follows on from what you just said, Mel, about um, having different requirements, particularly the animal welfare charity example being a good one, different requirements to the ACNC. So it's worth reiterating that the ACNC will decide on an organisation's eligibility to be registered as a charity. So if we take the animal welfare example, an organisation may have all the right things in place to get that endorsement as or get that registration as a charity um, for that purpose. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it also ticks off all the boxes that the ATO requires for endorsement uh, for a particular tax concession. And that's a way to, I suppose, highlight the line between the two agencies' um, collaboration in this area is that the ACNC will do the first step of deciding whether or not your organisation is eligible as a charity according to charity law. And then it's passed to the ATO to figure out whether it's eligible for a tax endorsement based on different rules. And many of these rules will cross over or, or many of the requirements will cross over about certain activities and whatnot, but they are distinct and separate. Okay, let's have a look at government DGR registers now. It's um, a particular type of organisation and that comes with a particular DGR endorsement. And there are four of them and I'll let um, Mel, I'll let you talk about each one. We'll do one by one. So firstly, sure. what what are they? Um, <laughs> what are they? So they are four. I mentioned we have 50 categories of DGR endorsement and the ATO makes the decision um, pretty much on most of them um, except for these four um, and another category that um, is about approved research institutes. But these four are looked after by separate government departments and they actually make the decision about whether or not your organisation is eligible to be entered onto their register and then obviously it'll come to the ATO after that after that for us to then finalise the endorsement for you. So the four categories are Register of Environmental Organisations, the Register of Cultural Organisations, Register of Harm Prevention Charities and the Overseas Aid Gift Deduction Scheme. So they're looked after by the Department of the Environment, um, the Department of Communications and the Arts, um, Department of Social Services and then lastly um, that one is looked after by DFAT, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Now these um, register endorsements because they're being made um, by the different government departments they all require like a ministerial sign-off so um, the minister responsible for those um, departments needs to sign off on on you know the application and then the application has to go through to treasury um, usually for the assistance and treasurer to sign off as well so they require like a two ministers sign off and then it comes to the ATO for us to um, just do the last bit so they can be um, lengthy um, applications and um, you know I'm, I'm not quite sure of what the current time frames are but um, it you know it, because it is requiring a ministerial sign off it, it can take um, quite a while for this to go through. So the way this would work in practice, for example, if an organisation is um, set up, uh, well, say it's an environmental organisation and it wants a DGR, the they would come to the ATO. Well, first, the DGR would have some conditions, right? And the conditions may say that one, of course, you need to be registered as a charity. And the second one may say that you need to be registered with the Register of Environmental Organisations. Mm -hmm. And then that's right. once you've gotten those two, so you've got the charity thing from the ACNC, you've gone to the Register of Environmental Organisations from that department, then 
it's to the ATO to finally endorse the DGR. Yes, that's right. And luckily for us, when it when it finally gets to us, it's it, we're not really making a decision because it's already been made in that process. And all we're doing is just giving effect to your endorsement, really updating the system so your um, DGR endorsement displays on that public public um, ABN lookup. So once it gets to us, it only takes a day or so. Okay. But um, it's just that that process. I think in between that that can can be lengthy for um for applicants and that depends on the organization itself too it might be quicker for some and, and longer for others yeah yeah just one last point on this slide we've got down here at the bottom it says pending changes mean these registered will be integrated with the acnc charity register can you just give us a, a bit of an explanation of this mel Yes, so um, back in, um, I think it was back in December 2017, um, the government actually made an announcement for um, a, a suite of DGR reforms and reforms to the to the government registers were, were one of those things. Um, so there, it, it was supposed to, to start on 1 July 2019, so this year, but we we had an announcement at the end of last year that it's actually going to be pushed um, back now to 1 July 2020. So what will happen is that, or well, the intention of these reforms is that these government registers um, will no longer be the responsibility of the individual government departments. and. Um, those people that have already been endorsed or on that register will come over and just be part of the ACNC's register. It will also mean that all new DGR applications will be assessed by the ATO. So they won't go through that lengthy um, ministerial sign-off process. But um, as yet, there's still um, unenacted reforms. Um, and at the moment, like the start date for those is set to be one on July 2020. Okay, let's get on to those two specific categories that we mentioned earlier, the health promotion charities and the public benevolent institutions. Mel did mention briefly that um, certain types of charities come, uh, or certain types of DGR categories require an organisation to be registered as a particular type of charity. And two of the most common ones are the health promotion charities and public benevolent institutions. Um, Mel, what are the requirements, broadly speaking, for the DGR for these two? Yep, so um, the, the main requirement is that you are registered with the ACNC under those subtypes, the um, Health Promotion Charity or Public Benevolent Institution. Um, and the next thing that happens when your application comes through to the ATO is that we will just make sure that you have um, an appropriate winding up and revocation clause um, in your governing rules and that, that makes sure that any kind of surplus gifts um, or assets are transferred to another deductible gift recipient if your endorsement is revoked or or if you wind up. Okay, and what just it's just, probably okay. like next to the register ones, it's one of the easiest DGR endorsements that we have to do because we don't assess your purposes or what your organization does because the ACNC has already done that for us. Yeah, and this is where there is a little bit of um, maybe misconception with um, where the roles and responsibilities lie. Again, it's it's that two-step process between um, from charity endorsement to tax endorsement, and just with the difference with these two is that once you're endorsed as one of these two types of charities, there is a, um, a DGR endorsement waiting for you with, at the tax office. So um, the, there is a I suppose, a desire to be registered as one of these two charities at the ACNC stage. It means that the ACNC will look at these applications carefully and make sure that an organisation does meet the requirements to be registered as either a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution. And if they do jump that hurdle and they are registered or well, they are eligible to be registered and the ACNC registers them as one of these two types of charities, um, we, the ACNC, pass that application or that notification over to the ATO and then it's up to the ATO to endorse the DGR. So, again, um, it's a 
collaboration between the ACNC and the ATO, I suppose, is the whole process. But um, the DGR endorsement requiring you to be registered as one of these types of charities means that there's a lot of um, focus and, and a lot of uh, assessment done at the charity stage before the DGR endorsement comes in. It, it might also be worth mentioning here as well that um, if you are registered with the ACNC under those two um, subtypes, you're also eligible for the FPT exemption. So when we were talking about those FPT concessions before, that exemption um, is only available to those um, two charitable subtypes as well as um, hospital employees as well. So that, that enables PBIs and HPCs to provide up to $30,000 like gross up of um, exempt fringe benefits to each employee. So it's, um, it's, it's quite uh, um, a, a good tax concession to have. Yeah, for sure. And it might be worth just mentioning here, because we have the first dot point here that says registered charities can apply to change their subtype through the ACNC charity portal online. Um, the relevance of that is, that, as Mel mentioned earlier, there are some cases where a charity may already be registered with the ACNC, but they would like to have different or, or more extensive tax concessions. So they want to apply for those directly through the ATO. And of course, that's the process that you would take. However, if the tax concession that you're applying for through the ATO requires you to be a particular type of charity, then in that case, there, there may be a requirement that you have to come back to the ACNC and have your charity registration uh, changed, which, which will involve a reassessment before the ATO will um, allow you to, to um, or will endorse any tax concessions. And that's because the condition on the tax concessions that you're applying for has particular requirements of the type of charity that um, your organisation is. Okay, that's the presentation proper. And I know there have been lots of uh, questions that have come through um, throughout the broadcast and um, our colleagues, Chris and Bree have been typing away madly trying to answer all your questions. We thought, we've had a few come through that we thought would be um, worth answering um, during the main broadcast because there might be some, uh, it might be relevant for a lot of people. So we might go through some of them now. And Mel, this is going to place you in the hot seat because um, predictably all the questions are about pati uh, particular tax concessions. So if you don't mind jumping in the hot seat, I, will I love throw, it. <laughs> great. I will throw you a couple of um, questions. Um, okay. We've, uh, We've had one on um, GST. Actually, it mentions GST exempt, so it might be worth reiterating the rules on this, but um, the question is that they're a new charity and they've been given GST exemption. I think this, this may be referring to a concession. Um, do we pay GST and reclaim it or tell suppliers not to charge us? Um, do you want to have a go at answering this? So it seems as though that there may yeah. be a little bit of confusion about the GST concession. Yeah, I... I think that um, as we were talking about before, there is confusion about the concession and that the concession is not an exemption from paying GST. So um, you can't get a supplier not to charge you GST. Um, it, it just, it, you know, it doesn't work like that. Um, so if, if you have paid GST on things that you have purchased, what you might want to do as an organisation is have a look and see whether it is beneficial for you to register for GST. Um, you know, and you, you do that by determining like what your threshold is and, you know, what kind of sales you actually make and whether or not you'd need to collect GST as well. But sometimes that enables you to claim back the GST that you've paid on supplies. Um, those GST concessions that like we were, were talking about before really relate to the things that your organisation does and whether or not there's some concessional treatment that can be applied to um, the way that you charge for goods that, you know, that you supply. We have a lot of information on our website about GST concessions and it's really clearly laid out there. Um, and what I'd suggest is if, if you can't find the information that you need to actually call the ATO on our not-for-profit line, which we'll give you at the end. Another question here 
um, on DGR school building funds. We've had a couple of questions on this, so I think it might be worth mentioning it. Uh, apologies to those for which it's not relevant, but we'll, we'll try and be quick about this. But there's a question about the use of DGR school building fund donations and, and what is deductible and what isn't. Yeah, so um, again, like we've got a lot of information on the ATO website about school building funds and we've also got a really good ruling that goes over in detail and provides a lot of examples about what a school building fund can use their money money for. Um, in a nutshell, there has to be a school um, in the ordinary sense of the word. So, um, and, and that fund can only use um, be used for the building, construction and maintenance of a school building. Um, so you can't use it to pay teachers wages or um, for you know, general school supplies. It has to be used for the building and for its maintenance. Um, I might just put a plug in, Matt, because about three weeks Go ago ahead, we sure. did, or four weeks ago, we did a, <laughs> we did a, um, a school building fund webinar um, and the recording for that is actually up on the ATOT TV um, site and it's really good. It, we go into a lot of detail about school building funds, exactly what you can use them for um, and just some tips for organisation to ensure that you've got good governance as well. Sounds good. Where can they find that? So just ATO TV is a, a good search they can do? Yeah, even if you go onto the ato.gov.au website and just put ATO TV in the search engine, it'll come up. And when you get onto ATO TV, you can then choose to go into the not-for-profit related um, web, um, There's webinar recordings and some videos and things like that. So you'll find the school building one there and it's the most recent one that we've done. Okay. Um, there's a question here about parent organisation having DGR and then the... The, I suppose the sub organization or the child organization also applying separately for it. Um, the, the question is, can it be done? And, and I suppose the follow up to that would be, is that common or, or, or should it be done? Um, look, I, I would say it actually depends. So if, if the sub organization is a separate entity um, in its own right, so you've got it because one of the requirements is, you know, you need an ABN and then that entity is actually um, doing the things it needs to do to have DGR endorsement, then it's possible. Um, you might want to just investigate your structure and look if you're not sure just to give us a call um, on our not-for-profit line and we can talk you through your eligibility. Good, good advice. That's generally the best way for, for real specific things, I think. Um, we can give you some broad yeah. suggestions here, but if, if you're really getting to the nitty and gritty of your organisation's um, finances and whatnot and structure, you best give um, the ATO a call or us, uh, depending on if it affects your charity status. Um, a question here for FBT concessions for religious ministers. And the reason I bring it up, we've had a few questions about it, so I think it must be relevant for some people. But again, apologies if it's not relevant for, for, for a number of you, but we'll be quick about it again. The question asks about how to move from FBT rebatable to exemption. Okay, so most churches are um, eligible for FBT rebate and that's for all of their employees. Um, but there are some very specific um, FBT concessions available for um, religious practitioners um, that are provided to them in, um, in the course of their, you know, religious duties. Um, and so basically those benefits are exempt. Um, now it's probably good timing that whoever asked this question did because the ATO um, is soon to release um, a final version of an updated ruling um, on for religious practitioners and the provision of um, exempt fringe benefits so um, if anyone's interested in that I'd probably suggest subscribing to our not-for-profit news service because there'll be a notification come out when that ruling is released and it goes over um, when you can provide exempt benefits to religious practitioners. We've got one question here we'll, we'll go through a couple more I think we've got a few minutes to, to spare there's one question here that touches on DGR reform I think but it 
it seems to um, display may maybe a common misconception about um, endorsement and, and assessment of applications. Where the question asks whether um, the propose uh, if the proposal that the ACNC be empowered to determine DGR applications instead of the ATO is is going ahead, and and if so, what's the timetable? Um, as you mentioned, Mel, there is there are proposals. To, to sort of reform the way certain DGRs are, or certain eligibility is assessed, but that's not quite the same as removing it from the ATO, right? No, and um, if I can just like really like simply say that those um, DGR endorsement and, and tax concessions are um, part of the tax law and they're administrated by the ATO. So while there might be some um, eligibility requirement that's decided by the ACNC, that decision about DGR endorsement will always sit with the ATO. And the reform itself is, um, I, I think this is what the question is referring to, but the reform itself is the thing that was supposed to at one stage go ahead this year, but has been put back a yeah. year. And that's where the four different um, DGR registers uh, were yeah. integrated within the charity register. Yeah, and there's a, um, the other big part of that reform um, was that all non-government DGRs would be required to be registered as charities. Um, so I, I think sometimes that's where that, that confusion um, comes in as well. So, so the reform is really just making it um, um, fair for everybody and um, putting that requirement in there that, that all DGRs need to be registered charities. Two more, I think, and then we'll finish up. I'm sure everyone's hungry. We've gone over lunchtime. Um, a question here, which which may be a bit um, heavy on the technical tax, I suppose, well, it is for me, but it says, um, was asking about the evidence required when removing GST from an expense that's considered below commercial rate when determining not to charge GST. Um, can you, maybe, can you simplify that for people, Mel, and, and provide yeah. a, a commentary on it? I think this person might be talking about non-commercial activities of a charity. Um, so basically, if, if you are um, providing something that is like less than 75% of, of the normal market value, um, then you can treat that as GST free. So like some examples are, you know, providing accommodation at less than market value. So I think that's what they're talking about. Um, if you need help in determining, um, you know, when that might be applicable, um, that's a really tax specific question. So I probably suggest giving um, the ATO a call just to talk about your particular circumstance. And just one more, um, a question about tax deductibility for charity fun, uh, fundraising in Australia when all the funds are spent on environmental activities overseas. I think there may be some confusion about um, tax deductibility if funds are either um, if funds are raised here and used overseas. Is there a distinction that the ATO makes for, for those situations? Um, look, the distinction usually comes at the point when we're endorsing someone. So um, charities need to meet an in Australia requirement. And for most categories, that requirement is that um, the charity is established and operated in Australia, um, but its its purposes and beneficiaries can be outside of Australia. So it is possible to, um, you know, raise tax deductible funds and then use them for your purpose, like for the purpose you've been endorsed outside of Australia. Um, there's only a couple of categories that um, there is an, a very specific restriction that the the recipients need to be in Australia. Um, example of those of, you know, Australian disaster relief funds and also necessitous circumstance funds. Um, so the DGR category itself actually, you know, specifies where your recipients need to be. Um, but, but it is possible if, um, you know, the organisation's DGR endorsed, like maybe an environmental organisation, and it, is, it, it can provide funds to, you um, do things outside of Australia as long as it's within its purpose. 
I hope that clears that one up for the people that asked it. But again, um, if, if you're not sure about the particulars of your situation, feel free to give us a call. Us, when I say us, it's the ACNC. And um, for more tax specific matters, give the ATO a call. And the ATO, we'll, we'll um, show you the phone numbers in a minute, but um, the ATO has a specific phone line dedicated to not-for-profit tax. So it's worth jotting that one down. Okay, here are some resources that you may find um, useful for this topic today. As I said at the beginning, we will uh, include all of these links in a follow-up email. So um, no need to frantically jot all these down now. Um, it's just a, a few of the higher level ones that, that you may want to have a look at. Um, particular fact sheets on tax concessions and, and registering as particular types of charities to be endorsed as certain tax concessions. And... Mel, some ATO resources that people might find useful. Yeah, uh, we've got a few there. Um, so we've got our um, not-for-profit homepage on ato.gov.au. So um, if you go onto the main ATO website, um, the, you, you'll see that there's a not-for-profit tab. Um, that opens up into a whole lot of very useful information, right from getting started to the different types of tax concessions that are available. Also some help if you've got any obligations or you've got employees or anything like that. It's very good good. Um, we did talk about ATO TV. Um, so the address for that is tv.ato.gov.au and keep an eye out for the not-for-profit tab to take you to our specific um, recordings that we've got there. Um, we have our not-for-profit information line. So the number there is 1300. 130248. Um, our, it's a small team, um, but they're also the team that do all the endorsements as well. So um, they're, they're knowledgeable on all that type of stuff. Um, Matt was asking me before, like how long the wait time is. So usually um, your call will be answered, you know, within 30 30 seconds to a minute, so you're not going to need to wait too long. We answer calls um, that have to do with general not-for-profit inquiries, tax-related things, and, and it's advice only. So if you do need to have any kind of updates to your accounts, maybe contact information or to talk about lodging um, an activity statement or something like that, you can choose that option um, when you ring that 1300 number as well. Um, we've also got a really useful handover checklist for not-for-profit administrators, which goes over kind of a lot of tax-related details that you might want to keep year to year, um, particularly, you know, when you're having your annual general meeting or you're, you know, changing um, your committee members. We've got a self-governance checklist for not-for-profit organisations. And then last of all, which I'd kind of, uh, you know, always need to give this a plug. We've got our not-for-profit news service. So um, we send out alerts and, you know, a regular newsletter when th things change or if there's any kind of updates to tax law, if we've got new rulings coming out or even, you know, when we're running a webinar. So that will kind of let you know um, what's going on in tax land. Excellent. And you can stay in touch with stuff regarding the ACNC. We've got commissioners columns and email updates that go out regularly, lots of web guidance, video content and podcasts on the website. The webinars is at acnc.cov.au forward slash webinars that has that hosts all our um, broadcasted webinars and, and they're listed there with the slides and, and whatever else may have been included in a particular webinar. And if you have any uh, particular queries about um, your organisation and its tax Oh, sorry, not tax, <laughs> and it's charity registration, mm -hmm. send us an email to advice at acnc.gov.au and we're pretty active on social media. We generally get these um, recordings published within a day um, of the broadcast, so we will send you out a follow-up email with um, lots of these links and resources and whatnot. Look out for that in the next day or so. Now, just before we go, if you have any um, feedback about the webinars specifically or any other sort of online guidance or education material, send us your feedback to education at acnc.gov.au. We, we do enjoy receiving um, any comments there. And on that note, just before you do um, finish this webinar, at the end there's a very short survey. I think it's only um, 
uh, to, to maybe three questions. Usually you can do it in 20 seconds. If you can fill in that survey, we'd really appreciate it. We get a lot out of the feedback that we get from the surveys at the end of a webinar. So if you do have an extra 30 seconds, that'd be great if you could um, just complete that for us. Okay, thank you for attending. We really appreciate your attendance today. We hope you got something out of it. Thanks, Mel, for helping us out and providing all the, all the brains for this one. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thanks to Chris and Bree who have been frantically answering all your questions as we've gone along. And we look forward to your attendance at our next